We're starting, the, starting out the chapter, chapter 4. We finished up chapter 3 last week with the baptism of Jesus. And so today we are picking it up with chapter 4. Um, you know, I can't help but think what a moment that must have been when Jesus came up from the water of the baptism and, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And yet, as we noted at the end of our study last week, whereas you might think that everyone that was present there at the moment that God spoke would have just dropped everything to follow Jesus, today in chapter 4 we find that Jesus, led by the Spirit, goes alone into the wilderness to endure temptation. It's good for us uh, to go into our study this morning with a right understanding of of what's going on. Uh, Why was Jesus led by the Holy Spirit to be tempted? Well, first, I think we need to deal with that word, to tempt or tempt. In our text, it is the Greek word parazo, meaning test, put to the test, and tempt, of course. Now, we read the definition there, the, the three possibilities and immediately we kind of set aside the meanings of test or to test and gear our minds probably more towards tempt. That's because in, in English, um, tempt has a bad connotation. It, it, it's enticing people to do evil. But the word in its original linguistic context means to test far more than it means to tempt in that sense of, in our English sense of the word. In fact, we find the same word in a surprising location in the Septuagint version of Genesis 22 and the story of God telling Abraham to take his son Isaac to offer him as a sacrifice. There it reads, and again, this is in the Septuagint version. The Septuagint version is just the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, and it dates back to the the 3rd century B.C. Um, It was translated into Greek by 70 Jewish scholars, and, was trans- and the translation was used by uh, and quoted by uh, the apostles. So it's a very valid translation. It does have its issues in some places, but it's still a very valid translation. Um, but in Genesis 22.1, there in the Septuagint, it says, and it came to pass after these things that God tempted Abram and said to him, Abram, Abram, and he said, Lo, I am here. So in the Septuagint version of Genesis 22, we have that same Greek word used here as in Matthew 3 and 4. Only Genesis 22 uses it in relation to God. Now quite clearly, the word tempt as used in the Septuagint version of Genesis 22 cannot mean they're uh, enticing, God is enticing Abram to do evil. It's unthinkable that God would try to make anyone be a wrongdoer. And it's quite clear in the text of Genesis 22 that God was testing Abram or Abraham. James 1 uses that same Greek word when it says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Now, as we will see in the text of Matthew 4, it is not God who does the tempting. Rather, it is the devil. But also, as we will see, it's the Holy Spirit that leads Jesus there to be tempted by the devil. So then, if the point was God trying to get Jesus to do evil, God would be acting against his own nature, and he would be culpable. But the efforts of the devil were most definitely to try to get Jesus to do evil. And the idea is this. When the devil tempts, God may use that occasion for his purpose, that is testing, for our continued sanctification. It's not meant to weaken us. It is meant to make us emerge stronger and finer and purer from the ordeal. Of course, this testing of the Lord Jesus, who was 100% God and 100% man, was, I believe, also for us, for our benefit. For one thing, it demonstrates to us that Jesus lived without sin. But also, we may learn from him how to yield to God's testing and how to resist the devil's temptation. 
Also, our Lord's experience here in Matthew 4 prepared him to be our sympathetic high priest. Hebrews 2 says of Jesus that in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. That's us, that's you and me. Jesus wasn't tempted so that the father could learn if his son was worthy and you know go on to plan b if he had to as we saw in the last chapter the father had already given jesus his approval this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased jesus was tempted so that every creature in heaven on earth and under the earth might know that that he is the conqueror he is the christ He exposed Satan, he exposed Satan's tactics, and he defeated Satan. Now the place where the events of our chapter happen is an area between Jerusalem and the Dead Sea. In the Old Testament, it's called Yeshimon, uh, which means devastation. The area measured about 35 miles by 15 miles, and it's an area of sand and crumbling, bare, jagged limestone. It's like a furnace of hot rock with drops as much as 1,200 feet. And in that wilderness, Jesus could be more alone than anywhere else in in Israel. The Holy Spirit led Jesus to where he would be alone for what was to come next. And this is a good spot for us to pick up with our text. Let's pray, and we will dig into chapter 4. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this morning, this brand new, fresh morning. Lord, we thank you for the breath that you've placed in our our lungs, for each new beat of our heart. Uh, You are truly, truly the living God. You are compassionate. You are slow to anger. You are abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Lord, we ask as we enter into this study of your written word that you would give us insight, that you would give us wisdom, that you would grant to us understanding help us to be discerning we pray this in jesus name amen all right so starting with chapter 4 verse 1 it says then jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward he was hungry Now, we might have previously thought of this episode as Jesus being led into the Judean wilderness to be tempted by the devil, a very quick process. But but Matthew gives us a time frame of 40 days and 40 nights. And during those 40 days and nights, Jesus fasted. Now, fasting is that Greek word nustevo, meaning going hungry, and it speaks of depriving oneself of food for a set time. But scripturally, the purpose of fasting is not the avoidance of food, nor is it to diet. It is to take one's focus off of the things of this world in order to focus completely on God. Fasting is not about, it's not, not about winning. Uh, it's not a game of strategy or anything like that. It's not a game of willpower. Fasting is a focus on God. It's removing things from our lives that distract from God and allowing our full attention then to be placed on him now also of note is that although there are many forms of fasting today fasting in scripture is always fasting from food Jesus was preparing he was probably considering his ministry as it would be and what would what would and what would come in his ministry and he was probably spending this time course in prayer to the father now jesus was not the only one recorded in the bible to do this kind of extended 40-day fast exodus 34 records that uh, moses while receiving the torah fasted on top of the mountain twice in fact and first kings 19 records that elijah fasted for 40 days and nights while running from jezebel now why 40 days and nights in fact what is the deal (laughs) with this number 40 in the Bible. There always seems to be uh, an ushering in of some kind after a 40-day event recorded in the Bible. Uh, the, the rains for 40 days and nights in the time of Noah, uh, Moses on the mountain for 40 days and nights, uh, again, twice, 
Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Before Samson's deliverance, Israel served the Philistines for 40 years. Goliath taunted Saul's army for 40 days before David, uh, before David arrived to kill him. Jesus remained on earth 40 days after his resurrection. And after each of these particular periods of time, there was something new that was ushered in. Now, others also look at this, uh, at, at, at this number 40 and the 40-day periods as uh, they look at it from another point of view, and they, they see the number 40 as speaking of testing or judgment. And, of course, you look back at that list of things, you can see that as well. Either way, the repeated appearance of 40 throughout the Bible seems to be significant. But of what, we really don't know. And that's because the Bible never specifically tells us why the repeated number 40 and what it means. Sometimes uh, a number in the Bible is just that. Sometimes a number in the Bible is simply a number. Even repeated numbers, such as the number 40. It's easy to get uh, kind of bogged down in, in looking over these mysteries, these things that we encounter in scriptures, looking for clues and, and hidden things, and, and get so involved in that that we just miss the point. God doesn't necessarily call us to search for secret meanings, hidden messages, or, or Bible codes. Now, it could be certainly fun to investigate these things, but we shouldn't allow ourselves to become distracted by them. There's, there's more than enough truth in the plain words of Scripture to meet all of our needs and to make us, as 2 Timothy says, complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Forty days and nights, that is a long fast. And after a fast that long, you would think that, that one would be in a dangerous place and particularly susceptible to temptation. But that wasn't the case. When we fast, we strengthen ourselves spiritually by diminishing our flesh and bringing our flesh under control. And we might think that Jesus, being fully God and fully man, used his divine powers then to overcome the enemy. In fact, that is just what the enemy wanted him to do. And it's certainly the case that Jesus had nothing in his nature that would give Satan a foothold. When, we, when, when speaking to his disciples in John 14, verse 30, Jesus said, The ruler, ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. However, his temptations were real just the same. Temptation involves the will, and Jesus came to do the Father's will. Matthew wrote in verse 2, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. And then Matthew writes in verse 3 that the tempter came to him. But it might surprise you to learn that it wasn't only at the beginning or only at the end of his fasting that Jesus was tempted. We know from the Gospel of Mark that he was there in the wilderness 40 days tempted by Satan. And the Gospel of Luke says that Jesus was tempted for 40 days by the devil. Now, the case is that Jesus was tempted during the 40 days and nights of his fast, not only at the end of his fast. What we have recorded in the Gospels, however, is just a selection of three of the temptations that he faced, but not all of them. There must have been many more. And in none did Jesus stumble. And keep in mind that he was not tempted by the Spirit. He was led to a place where he would be tempted. Aside from the three temptations we, we, that we're going to read about coming up next in a few moments, what else would Satan have been tempting Jesus with? Well, I think we can look back to Genesis 3 for the answer. There we find the serpent tempting, starting with the phrase, Is it really true that God said? Remember, remember Jesus being fully God and fully man, having just received open commendation from the Father that confirmed his ministry. The temptation that Satan offered was probably doubt. You know, maybe, Jesus, you just imagined or misheard God. Satan does not tempt with things that are beyond belief or with lies that make no sense. For instance, the fact that the devil 
tempted Jesus to turn stones into bread means that Jesus could, in fact, turn stones into bread. Verse 3 continues. And it says, Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So why this particular temptation? Well, we just read, of course, that Jesus was hungry. So there was a physical desire and need that was at work. In keeping with the senses, the, the wilderness was littered with little pieces of limestone rock. You know, water and wind action uh, work to erode rocks. And the wilderness uh, there... It, it, the wind and the, the different actions that were eroding that rock would, would work to leave them reminiscent, rounded and reminiscent of uh, little loaves of bread. So his own vision was playing into the temptation. And this was a multi-layered temptation. There was the temptation for him to act independently of the Father, but he came to obey the Father. It played on doubt. If you are God's beloved son, why doesn't your father feed you? Why did he lead you into this wilderness with no provision of food? The suggestion was, perhaps God does not love you after all. Or perhaps you're not God's son. And then we have another part of the temptation. Pride. If you are who you believe yourself to be, Prove it. Prove yourself. Now, allow me a couple of moments to, uh, to be open with, with you guys about a few things. Um, not, not that I you know, hide things and every once in a while I choose to reveal them. That's, that's not, <laughs> that, that's not what, I, what I'm talking about here. Um, but there are some things that, that you know, pastors are not supposed to talk with their congregations about. And in today's the atmosphere of today's church, not this church, but the atmosphere of church at large. Um, the pastor is supposed to uh, cast a vision you know, that the congregation then is responsible for following. As if you know, he's the CEO of a company or um, the pastor is supposed to appear to be above the congregation. But the true biblical model for the church is the pastor, while having authority within the church, is also a congregant. And temptation is as much uh, a reality for pastors as it is for everyone else in the church. Pastors are people. And, and members of the congregation whom God has given a level of authority to, but they are not special, less sinful people who are above the congregation. But of course, in the church at large today, in the, this atmosphere that, that the church has adopted, uh, pastors are expected to be certain things, snazzy dressers, uh, visionary leaders, authors, pop culture icons, businessmen, and more. And they're supposed to tell stories about themselves that insinuates that they're just a little bit more holy than the regular congregation. And none of those things are biblical as far as a role for a pastor. And the pastor is, is really supposed to be a servant, not, not lording himself over the flock. The Bible says that the role of the pastor is to, according to 2 Timothy 4, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. And my point is that as a pastor, it's easy to get caught up in the prove yourself thing and become distracted by things that are not the biblical role of a pastor. Faithfully teaching God's word, that is the top calling of the pastor. Other things, uh, I have to leave to God. Believing that the faithful teaching of his word, while it might not grow a, a big church, will grow big Christians. But I could, you know, when stressed and in, in, in trying to figure out how uh, the church is going to, to pay rent. I could be tempted to, to 
preach a series on faithful tithing and giving with a cheerful heart. Um, I, I could, uh, when attendance is, is low, be tempted to uh, preach a series about inviting others to church. And, and that's not wrong. If, if, if hearing the Bible taught faithfully is important, we should be inviting people and bringing friends and family to church. But I could also, when I'm seeing church members come and go, be tempted to set aside the Bible uh, to preach a, a more pop culture-oriented series uh, on the latest movie or um, the latest attention-grabbing topic in order to appeal to and attract crowds. But so, so far, I've, I've done my, my best to, uh, to, to stick to the mission, to, to faithfully teach the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter, um, leaving those other things to God. And, and so, you know, we receive admonitions according to the Lord's timetable, not, not according to my timetable. And we receive admonition through his word, not according to... Uh, what I saw somebody post on Facebook and I think needs to be addressed. You know, I, I don't, and I'm not, I'm not saying these things to highlight myself at all. I, I think that occasionally when the teaching of God's word allows it, um, I do need to remind us, all of us, that, that, that uh, of these things so that, so that none of us become uh, distracted or discouraged, right? Um, so what did, back to the text, what did turning stones into bread have to do with Jesus' mission? Absolutely nothing. Satan would have liked nothing better than to have Jesus distracted, off alone in the wilderness, turning rocks into bread, while the whole world perished. In verse 4, the Lord quoted Deuteronomy 8, 3, to counter Satan. Feeding on and obeying God's word is more important than consuming physical food. In fact, as Jesus explains to his disciples in John 4, it is more important than food. Jesus said to them, I have food to eat which you do not know. And he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. There's, there's a lesson for us here. What's, what's more important, life or obedience to God? Obedience to God is more important than life. Some Christians get that, others don't. Um, we support missions in, in nine countries. It, this little church, we do. Over 10% of our monthly intake goes into missions. So, you know, your giving does make a difference all over the world. And in some of those places, the missionaries prepare themselves to die before they go into a village or an area in which to declare Jesus to the people. Because there is the distinct possibility that they will either be put in jail, somewhere where nobody knows where they are, or that they will be killed. But of course, for most of us uh, here this morning, the possibility is more like, you know, we could get rejected, or we could be made fun of, or you know, we could be defriended or blocked, you know. That's it. And even then, it's not us that they're rejecting. It's Jesus. Now, what about other levels? Just, just life in general, being obedient to God. Jesus placed great importance on loving others. Telling one man, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So in the text here, we have Jesus countering with Scripture. And he had to know Scripture before quoting it. Okay, yeah, he was the Son of God. But he found importance in talking about Scripture with others and in studying I think sometimes we downplay or perhaps don't really grasp the fact that Jesus was fully God and fully man. So what, what's important about that? Well, he wasn't born knowing how to talk. He wasn't born potty trained. He wasn't born knowing all these things. He did have to grow and he had to learn. We make the assumption that, that Jesus was 
born knowing all things. Now, what he knew and what he didn't know, I don't know. The Bible makes it clear that Jesus was always God in all eternity, past, present, and in the future. He has been, is, and continues to be the second person of the Trinity. But in regards to the incarnation, the human Jesus, the question of when he knew that he was God is interesting, but Scripture does not address the question. We know that as an adult, Jesus fully realized who he was. He expressed it this way in John 8, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. It also seems uh, that at some point as a child, he was aware at least to a degree, and he studied and he learned. When he was a child and, and his parents brought him to Jerusalem, he spent time in the temple and with the teachers. And it would be easy to conclude that he also spent much time in the local synagogue. And in Luke 2, he answered his parents, Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? And the text of Luke after that says that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. So Jesus was learning and he was growing. And when tempted by Satan, he responded with Scripture because he knew Scripture. And we can respond to temptation the very same way. But we need to have a knowledge of God's Word in order to do that. You know, faithfully attending these services uh, here where we study the Bible verse by verse is a great way of learning Scripture. But it's not a substitute for personal time in God's Word. And if you find yourself consistently giving into temptation, then I would suggest that you commit time to filling your heart with Scripture. I mean, certainly faithfully come to church, but also faithfully spend time in God's Word outside of church. And be wise about it so that you're not spending that time listening to, to someone who's twisting God's Word. Now, as the apostles did, I spent a good deal of time warning Warning you, there are wolves dressed as sheep, and many of whom are in the pulpit. And though what they offer is sweet, we should avoid them in favor of what is solid and true. Verse 5 continues. It says, Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give His angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. All right, so we're now entering into the second temptation. The term holy city, that was a special designation for the city of Jerusalem that was used by the Jews. And remember that Matthew was originally writing this gospel to a Jewish audience. Now the second temptation was very subtle, although the events of the temptation not so much. The devil took Jesus into Jerusalem, into the temple, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Now how this came about, we don't know. We only know that Jesus was taken to the highest point of the temple. Now, the highest point probably refers to the southeast corner of the temple, which was some 450 feet above the Kidron Valley. And there, Satan again begins with casting doubt, saying, if you are the Son of God. And then the temptation to prove it, throw yourself down. And this time, Satan used the word of God the way that deceivers all use it, falsely and for their own profit. The devil quoted from Psalm 91 where God promised to care for his own. Now, in modern day church, this would be the equivalent of a sermon about Joseph's dream and then teaching the congregation that to please God, they should be pursuing their own big dream or advising someone that they can take a foolish risk because the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ. Essentially, the, the devil is saying to Jesus, if you really believe the scriptures, then jump. Let's, let's see if the Father cares for you. 
Now, Jesus has the ability to do what the devil is challenging uh, him to do. Later on in, in chapter 26 of Matthew, just prior to his arrest and his crucifixion, Jesus states that he, if he wanted, he could call on the Father to rescue him by sending more than 12 legions of angels. So the devil's quotation, it's a blatant misuse of scripture in an attempt to manipulate Jesus. The original Old Testament context of Psalm 91 does not imply that God will send protecting care for every harmful situation. That is, if you keep it in context. Just as Joseph having a dream does not mean that we should have a dream or that doing all things through Christ speaks of God bending to our will. So note how the Lord responds. He responds by the proper use of God's word. He quoted the text of Deuteronomy 6.16, which speaks of Israel's questioning of whether the Lord was among them because they were thirsty. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massah. We should not divorce one part of Scripture from another. Instead, we should approach Scripture according to context and original intent, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, as Paul wrote to the Corinthian believers. When approached in the right way, Scripture will always expound upon and explain Scripture. We can prove almost anything we want by the Bible if we isolate text from from context and, and turn them into pretext you know in like manner we could take any text and do the same thing we could take you know uh, uh, Melville's Moby Dick what is it 135 chapters can you imagine how we could twist that story if we just started cutting and pasting and reassembling it's important for us as believers to read all scripture and study all that God has to say for all of it's profitable for daily life but but we may make it unprofitable if we strip strip it away from its original context now why is Satan trying to get Jesus to jump well Satan is trying to get Jesus to test his father in two ways First, inappropriately testing his father's love and trying to manipulate him by intentionally putting himself in harm's way. And secondly, to avoid God's plan, to avoid the suffering of the cross. If Jesus were to cast himself off the, the high place of the temple and the angels rush in to rescue him, Think of how all the people seeing this would react. It would gain Jesus' quick acceptance as Israel's Savior, but not by the Father's way of Jesus' obediently proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and then suffering on the cross. It would bypass all of that. The great problem is that it would also mean there is no salvation offered in Christ. At best, he would be the conquering king for Israel, but would leave Israel and all the people of the world dead in their sins and their trespasses. Verse 8. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to, to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. So with the third temptation that's recorded for us here in this gospel, the devil, to, he takes Jesus up on an exceedingly high mountain. This was probably Mount Hermon, uh, the highest point of Israel. So high, in fact, that it, it's capped in snow. Now, we'll see this same mountain several more times as we study through the Gospels. The temptations, before they had a, a personal dimension and a, and a national dimension, but now the devil adds a universal dimension. The devil shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. Now, 
Mount Hermon is tall, but it's not that tall. In fact, there is no mountain that tall. So there's something more going on here, a, a supernatural element. Or perhaps the idea of all the kingdoms of the world was more just of an idea the devil presented to him uh, from this high location. Um, in Luke's parallel account, Satan emphasizes that he has been given authority over the kingdoms of the world and he can give it to whomever he wants. That is a lie. While Satan does have a significant influence over the people and the powers of this world, he does not own the world. It's owned by God. In 2 Corinthians 4, the text says that Satan, the God of this age, has blinded minds. In Ephesians 2, the text, uh, the, text the sinful world walks according to Satan and that Satan works in the sons of disobedience. Now, Satan is able to be the God of this world because he has usurped the hearts of people. As 1 John says, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one, but his influence is limited. Satan lies. In fact, he is the father of lies, and he does not have ownership of the world. It is owned by God. Psalm 24.1 says very expressly, very plainly, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Satan's offer to Jesus indicates his own delusion. And his lie is just another offer of a shortcut, a way to bypass the pain and the suffering of the cross that, that was the will of the Father. Temptation involves the twisting of reality. So Jesus again counters with the truth of Scripture. Jesus' quote comes from, the multiple pla comes from multiple places in Scripture. It's found in Deuteronomy 6.13. Deuteronomy 10, 20, as well as in Joshua 24, 14. The essence of his quote is that the true and living God alone is worthy of worship. Satan's demand for Jesus to worship him reveals his overall objective, but it is also the essence of sin. Sin desires to cast off God's will and have one's own way, making oneself out to be the God of one's own life. Worship of God is the tangible demonstration that a person has given over the rule of one's life to God's will and not one's own will. The chapter ends with, well, I'm sorry, the, we're going to end with, with verse 11 this morning, which says, Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. So the devil left Jesus. That, that was the immediate outcome of Jesus' rebuke of Satan. But this is only the first set of many devil-inspired attacks that Jesus will experience during the course of his ministry. However, in each instance, Jesus does exactly what he did here. He stays fixed on the Father's will. As James 4 and 1 Peter 5 points out to us, resisting the devil's attacks through standing firm on the truth of God will cause Satan to flee. This section closes out with Jesus being ministered to by angels. And the implication is that angels have been watching all of this and now they give homage to the Son. This initial victory is it's momentous and it will result ultimately in the conquest of all evil and the establishment of God's reign throughout the universe. All of heaven knows the significance and the angels serve the Son who now advances the kingdom. And the ministry of the angels also plays into what Jesus said earlier. You shall worship the Lord your God and Him only you shall serve. The devil finds himself rejected and Jesus finds himself ministered to by the angels. Now that's as far as we go into chapter 4 this morning, but I want to close with an observation. The Bible teaches that Jesus is fully man and fully God. However, many Christians are uneasy with Christ's humanity. We place a great emphasis on his divinity and and we'll defend that with, with all the vigor we can. But we can't talk too much about his humanity 
because we're afraid we might be overemphasizing it. And the reason, uh, the reason uh, for that is, is barring those who refuse to, you know, all of this, barring those who refuse to, uh, to believe that Jesus is a historical figure, um, even though there's more historical evidence of his existence than any other notable figures in history or even of ourself, the reason for that is the world tends to, to deny the deity of Jesus and acknowledge only his humanity. And as a result, we defend Jesus' deity vigorously, and we become suspicious then of anyone who seems to overemphasize his humanity. But the New Testament is not uneasy about either one, Jesus' deity or his humanity. It declares both natures quite emphatically at that. Consider what Paul very early on wrote about Jesus in Romans 1. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now, as we saw in the first chapter, the very first gospel, Matthew very quickly emphasizes both Jesus' divine conception and his human lineage. And with Jesus' baptism, Matthew has clearly emphasized Jesus' divine nature as the beloved Son of God. But he just as clearly emphasizes that Jesus was spirit-led into the wilderness. And he was a human combatant in his victory over Satan. You know, Jesus came to live a fully human life just like you and me which meant voluntarily limiting himself to his humanity. Yes, he performed miracles. Yes, he healed people. And yes, he even raised people from the dead. But note what Peter said in Acts 2 when preaching about Jesus at Pentecost. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know. God performed the miracles, the wonders, and the signs through Jesus. Jesus lived a godly life, pure life, because he relied on the power of the Spirit, and Jesus fulfilled the messianic promises as the Spirit anointed human descendant of David. His redemptive mission included living a fully human life that overcame all temptation in the power of the Spirit so that he could offer an unblemished human life on the cross as a sacrifice for the sins of humanity. And that sacrifice could only be sufficient because the humanness of Jesus' sacrifice was sustained by his divine nature as the God-man endured the cross. But while retaining full deity, he limited himself to full human experience. Jesus lived as human as you and I. He suffered through this fallen world just as we do. He endured temptation just as you and I. Jesus came to pay the penalty for our sins, but he also showed us how to live, how to resist temptation, and how to please God. But perhaps more important is this. Hebrews 4, seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because Jesus Christ has made the perfect once-for-all sacrifice and has ascended to the Father, we can hold firmly to the faith that we profess. And we can approach the throne of grace with confidence. He can intercede uh, on, our, our, on our behalf perfectly. When we're tempted, we can come to Him for help, and He will freely give it. And when we sin, we know that his sacrifice perfectly atones. So because of Christ, we can come boldly into the presence of God and we can get the help we need when we need. 
There's no trial that is too big. There is no temptation that is too powerful. Jesus Christ can give us mercy and grace whenever we need. But I also want you to know that his sacrifice atones for those who accept the free gift of grace that is offered by him. And you can do that by simply receiving it in a confessional prayer, a prayer to God. As the Bible says in Romans 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then in case we have any doubt that that speaks and refers to us, that that's open to you and me, verse 13 says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that when we are in need, Lord, we can come right to you. When we have stumbled, we can come right to you. You have experienced everything that we experience. You are sympathetic Lord it's hard for us to to really grasp just what it means that you are 100% man 100% God it's hard to fully grasp it's hard to fully grasp your, your ministry here Lord. that you would even do what you've done for us Lord just how much you love us it's hard to understand it. it's, it's difficult Father, we just ask, Lord, that you would continue to, to lead us into testing with the idea, the goal being our purification, Lord, our sanctification, Lord. Help us, Lord, when we're in trial, to be honoring to you, to be pleasing to you. Lord, protect us in times of temptation. Help us to be faithful to your word. And Lord, that, that we would faithfully study your word and, 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 and memorize your word so that it is in our hearts, Lord. Lord, we ask that you would establish us in all of your good things and we ask that you would guard our hearts and, and, and keeps our, keep our hands and our minds from evil. Lord, protect us from the deceptions, the, the lies, the temptations of our enemy, the devil. Lord, we again thank you when we endure trials. Thank you for being our great high priest, Lord. And we place ourselves before you, desiring to do your will. We ask that you would lead us in victory and use us to spread the knowledge of Jesus Christ the unsaved world. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face and his light to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you. Give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, that's Jesus the Messiah, our Lord and our Savior. Everyone said, Amen.